Okay. Okay. Uh, let's start with the movie now. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. And you can see the mm -hmm. PowerPoint too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me turn my phone off. Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about yet another movie. And uh, this is the uh, third Wednesday of this month, and it's being live streamed, and you can see the recording on YouTube later. And uh, as I mentioned before, every time I told you about this movie, uh, there are a lot of versions on YouTube, many, many, uncountable, because this is a very simple and easy to produce, easy to stage play and uh, many many high schools oh come on top sorry gee <clears throat> okay i i guess you can hear me right because someone just called me anyway uh, so this is a play by thornton wilder and uh, many high schools chose to put this stage, uh, put this play uh, on the stage themselves. That's why you can see many versions of this production. Gee, what is the matter? Okay. Uh, let me turn this voice to low because I turned the phone off, but it's still ringing. I'm sorry about that. I got to look into that. Anyway, let's uh, start from fresh. There are so many versions of this uh, play on YouTube because many high schools uh, choose to stage this play because it's very simple and it's relatable to their lives, the students' lives, and because it's about teenagers. And uh, it has no prop or anything it's a very very simple play you don't have anything not even a, a kitchen or a chair or something so it's really easy to do it it's like our chinese opera Be beijing or peking opera you just put a, a square table there and you can put on the entire show without any other fancy stuff on the stage or costume or whatever so it's very very popular but uh, you can see some very good productions and here are three of them one is in, the first one is uh, put up by lincoln center uh, which is uh, respectable enough and uh, it has uh, several notable people but not popular uh, movie movie stars but the second one uh, is gee i didn't say when it's like 2003 uh, and it's got paul newman who is a superstar he plays the stage manager huh so this story is about the life of a small or two or several families in a small town with nothing notable that's happening however uh, uh, strangely enough, there is one main character in the play, which is called the stage manager. And the Paul Newman, in this version, he plays the, the stage manager. But uh, many decades ago, when he was younger, he played uh, the boy in another version, but I could not find that version. So, so that's the second one with Paul Newman in it. That's one thing that makes this version very interesting and the third one uh, has william holden in it he was very very young probably younger than any movies that you've seen him in like gui he da Qiao and so on he's a very famous movie star but but when he was very young he was in this version of our town and i put it uh, below the first two with a space in between, because as I emphasized before, I want you to choose one of the two on top. And if you finished one or finished both, then you can choose to watch the third one because uh, 
the first impression is very, very important. In this story, it is shocking for you to see the movie or the play to the end, and you felt unbearably sad. However, the third version, because it wants people not to feel so sad, they change the ending. So it really greatly reduced the impact on the audience. So I wish you would watch it, the first one of the first two versions, so that you can feel the sadness at the end of the story. But uh, William Holden's version is also a good version with a different ending. And I was pretty mad when I saw it. But later on, I realized that the author, the playwright who wrote this play, Thornton Wilder, he changed his mind and he worked with these people. Yeah, after the, the first version came out uh, on stage, and when they wanted, that was in 1939, they wanted to make a movie out of it. And the, the playwright decided to work with the producer to change the ending so that it's not so sad. So it's still a good movie, but uh, it's got a different ending. <laughs> okay. And today I wish you would uh, have prepared something to say, anything you want to say. You can just unmute yourself and say something and uh, just to encourage you or give you a hint what you can talk about. I said that uh, you could say something about Paul Newman or you can say something about William Holden. I'm sure you, you've you seen one or many of their movies you can talk about. Yeah, just interrupt us anytime you want, please. Okay, let's start with Our Town, which is a book, a play printed as a, in a book. Okay, so it's not a movie uh, as its first incarnation. Uh, Our Town was written in 1938. It's a three-act play. Three-act means uh, san mu, I guess, just san mu. But, so you have a play, usually it has a single mu act or two or three or more. But the most common, you would have a du mu ju, which would be a one-act play. And quite often, you would have a three-act play, which is standard to have uh, three or four. Usually we say qi cheng zhuan he. Uh, in the play, you would say qi cheng, maybe not a zhuan, and then he. So that would be a three-act play. And if there's a zhuan, then there will be four acts. So an act is a mu, ha, ji, mu ji, ha. And uh, it was written by Thornton Wilder, which won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Uh, when this came out, people really were shocked to read something so original and uh, moving, and uh, they, they were really moved. And immediately it was recognized by getting a Pulitzer Prize. The, to put it simply, the play tells the story of the fictional American small town. Uh, this town is called Grover's Corner in New Hampshire, but it's a, a fictional. There is no such a town there. And it tells a story between 1901 and 1913. It's just some people going around doing simple things as people do. There's nothing spectacular. There's no hook or nothing that makes you shocked or something. It's just uh, about simple lives. So many people uh, think that it is a life about, it is a story about everyday living, but not from the view of the writer. He doesn't think so. Uh, this is a kind of a revolutionary 
way to write a play, and uh, this is considered uh, metatheatrical devices. I mean, a, a move, a story with uh, with metatheatrical devices. Uh, this word is called meta theatrical devices. That meta is something that's different from usual. So usually you have a movie or a play that has a use standard theatrical devices. Uh, but this one uses several very different devices. Device 就是一个东西, or something, just a, a tool or something mechanical that you use. So when you write a play, uh, you can go with some uh, simple devices to to present a story. But this story is presented using several metatheatrical devices. The, the prefix meta, if we have time, we can go into that, but it's very, how do you say? It's very hard to explain. Meta means something beyond. It's about something, but it's more than what it is uh, usually. When I was uh, uh, in high school, uh, I came across a word called metaphysics or metaphysical, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned, beyond something beyond physical. So you have a scientific world where everything follows the scientific rules, but there are some thinking that are beyond the physical world. We call it phys uh, meta physics. Uh, if you say in Chinese, it would be xing shang xue. Uh, you can say philosophy. Uh, metaphysics is like philosophy, the thinking of something beyond its physical form. So, so it's called metaphysical. Uh, and here we have metatheatrical. It is a Beyond the usual way of telling a story on the stage, you have something that is different. Uh, that's that's called the meta theatrical. And here in this play, Thornton Wilder uses meta theatrical devices, setting the play in the actual theater where it is being performed. So you are looking at this play in which there is a stage manager. He, he comes onto the stage and talks directly to you, the audience. That is one thing that is meta, meta theatrical. It makes you feel that this is more than a regular play. It is something presented differently. For one thing, he's talking to you. He's not talking to other people. He is the, the narrator of the story, and he presents sto the story in many ways that are not the regular way. For example, he would say, uh, here is the town a newspaper uh, uh, publisher, and he's going to tell you about something. And then he says, oh, this is a scientist there at the college who is going to tell you about this town and so on and so forth. So this is a very strange for you as a regular theater goer to see somebody there telling you these are the people. So it makes you very much aware that this is a play and not just a story. It is a play with the narrator. Okay, in the very old times, uh, if you watch a uh, Greek tragedy, there would be several people, like two, three, or five people. That is a chorus. The chorus would be standing next to the main characters who are who are playing the story, and the chorus would make comments. They would introduce you to the people or the background, or they would say show you some reaction they feel 
toward what happened. So this is a very ancient way of uh, metatheatrical devices, having a chorus there to, to be between the real story and the audience. They are there as a narrator or a commentator. And, and the Thornton Welder certainly took it from the Greek, uh, Greek tragedies. And uh, he put this stage manager there to show this is a metatheatrical move, uh, play. Okay. So this person uh, is actually the most uh, important person on stage. He's not the leading character. He's not a supporting cast. He is in charge of the whole thing. And he directly talks to the audience, and he brought on guest lecturers, and uh, sometimes someone in the audience would raise a question and he would answer it. And uh, sometimes uh, when there is a need, he would play a character in the play. For example, in this play, we had this young boy and girl in high school, and they started dating and went to an ice cream parlor or probably a drugstore and having some ice cream. And the stage manager at this moment, he is the owner of the ice cream parlor, serving them with ice creams. So this is a, a it makes the audience realize that they are watching something different from the usual stuff. And another thing about this play is that it, they are, it, it is almost bare on the stage. You could hardly see anything. People would walk about doing things, pretending what they're doing. For example, they would eat a supper or the mother would be cooking and so on, but you don't see a kitchen or a dining room. Well, occasionally there is a table and some chairs, but most of the time there is no stove, there is no dishes, there, 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 there are nothing on the stage, a very minimal um, set or props. Huh? So set and the prop are words to describe what's on the stage. Uh, the best way to compare this to is to a Peking opera. You have very symbolic uh, things on the stage. For example, a person who's riding a horse would just be carrying a stick uh, as if he was uh, whipping the horse and he would run on the stage without a horse. Uh, that is uh, how you need to imagine things. So it's a bare stage with very few exceptions and the actors mime actions. Mime means ya huh? Uh, so they would uh, pretend, for example, the milk uh, delivery boy, he would pretend that he was taking bottles out of the uh, box and giving to the customer, even though there were no bottles. And he was just miming the action of delivering the milk. Uh, so, so all these things make this play very, very different. And the word to describe this situation is metatheatrical device. So this play was first uh, on stage in 1938, which means it's not on Broadway. So it's off Broadway, either in the local theater or off Broadway. At that time, probably there was not a place called off Broadway because Broadway is such a huge money machine that every play wants to be on Broadway. So if you're not that famous or not good yet, you would be opening on the stage that is off Broadway, OFF, -F, that is not on Broadway. So because it was very successful, not on Broadway. Later on, it was brought on Broadway and they had a very successful run and won the Pulitzer Prize for drama. And this is the first time Thornton Wilder uh, received the Pulitzer Prize for his plays. He is mainly 
uh, a playwright. He wrote many uh, plays, but he's also a novelist, and uh, he wrote other things, did other things too. So this is the first Pulitzer Prize he won, and uh, another famous uh, playwright whose name is Edward Albee, he praised that this play is the greatest American play ever written. That is a very high praise for anyone to say, but for Edward Albee, that really takes, uh, get people's notice. Uh, the play remains popular today uh, with, and the revivals are frequent. So when you have a play, you have a run either off Broadway or on Broadway or uh, in London, it'll be on West End and it could be anywhere. Uh, for example, in Seattle, we have many theaters putting up plays. For example, Paramount is probably one of the more famous one. And uh, if you have, uh, if you are very successful, you could have a, a run of several hundred times on, for example, on Broadway. And uh, if you're really successful, uh, it can go into thousands of runs. And if you're really, really, really successful, you never get off, you never close, you just keep going like the mousetrap uh, written by Agatha Christie. It has been on, on the stage except for a very brief period due to the COVID pandemic. It has been on stage since probably 1954 all the way till now, it's still running. So that's the extraordinarily successful play that is The Mousetrap by Agatha Christie. But most, almost every other play uh, had to stop one, one day. Uh, sooner or later, it, it stops. And when they brings it back, when it's brought back um, to Broadway, then it's called a revival, 就是重新再 放上舞台, huh? that's called a revival, huh? revive, uh, you know, arrive or arrival or survive. The, the, the vive means live huh? and revival means again, put it, giving it life again. So revival 就是重新上演的意思, huh? So Edward Albee says, this is the greatest American play ever written. So that's the highest uh, uh, comment you could uh, ever say about a play. So we need to talk a little bit about Al Al Edward Albee. And his most famous play was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And uh, when he wrote that, uh, Pulitzer Prize decided to award him with the Pulitzer Prize for the best play. However, uh, the people behind the Pulitzer Prize at that time, it was Columbia University, they decided that this is not classy enough. It's too vulgar. It's about a lot of sexual con content and the language is not clean. So they did not give it to Edward Elby. But uh, later on, uh, it, that play was so famous, and he is so famous that he uh, ended up getting real Pulitzer Prizes three times. Uh, he is considered a American version of theater of the absurd. Theater of the absurd I talked about before is translated into Huang Miu Ju. When the times are difficult, people want to rebel. They have lots of anger and they want to do things, things to shock people. Uh, that's how that gave birth to the theater of the absurd in Europe. And in America, Edward Elby is considered one of the followers. The original ones are um, Europe, in Europe 
like uh, Eugene UNESCO or uh, I once talked about this before, but uh, if you know or like plays and movies, eventually you need to learn something about theater of the absurd. This is considered a counterculture. It's like uh, the the hippie days. Uh, many people felt uh, rebellious and wanted to do things to be defiant of the st status quo. Uh, that's the time probably in the 60s and the 50s. And uh, three of his plays won one Pulitzer Prize for drama and two of his plays won best play, uh, get, got Tony Award. So he's a very respected, uh, rebellious kind of playwright. And these are his famous uh, well-known uh, plays and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is uh, one of, of his most famous ones. It later on turned into a movie with uh, Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor and uh, George Siegel and uh, Sandy Dennis and it was directed by Michael, what's his name? Nicholas, Nichols, Mike Nichols, okay. Mike Nichols, okay. Mike Nichols also did The Graduate and many other very revolutionary movies too. Uh, he started out doing comedy with Elaine May, but the later on he became a very respected uh, movie director. So these are Edward Albee's play in which uh, among these uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is uh, the, his most famous uh, play. And this is, uh, if you're accustomed to traditional forms of movies or plays, this is shocking to you because none of the rules apply anymore. It's just a, a chaos. Um, in some way, the new Michelle, uh, uh, what, Michelle Yeoh's movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, I guess that's how, what it's called. It has a similar thing, but it's not about sexual or relationship between couples. Uh, but when you're so used to the conservative kind of uh, the art form, you really re would, I, I could try to use a better way. I would say you, you're you shocked so much that you, you refuse to understand or accept the, the new art form, but things are changing. And uh, we, as an older person, we should uh, be patient and try to understand these new things, even though it's like 50, 60 years ago. It is uh, still shocking nowadays. And uh, he also, Edward Albee, did some movie uh, adaptations and the uh, changed for example breakfast at tiffany was a short novel or a novella and he changed it into adapted for a movie with audrey heaven and the lolita is a famous novel by nabokov the russian uh, novelist who became american and these are both with a streak of uh, defiance in it. And uh, there are other stories that he did that are very good uh, movies. And uh, here we have uh, the awards. The first three are his, uh, no, the middle three are the Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, A Delicate Balance, Seascape, uh, Three Tall Women. These are far less popular or well-known as who's afraid of a genial wolf 
for which he got a Tony Award. Tony Award is for stage. Okay, Oscar is for movies, and Tony Award are for stage plays. And the last one also won a Tony Award for Goat or Who is Sylvia. So he received some very prestigious awards, and there are many others. These are just the, the Pulitzer Prizes and the Tony Awards. So this is our deviation to Ed Edward Elby, and let's go back to our main story, which is Meta Theater. I checked, and in Chinese, it's called the Yuan Ju Chang, which is a very specific new translation, and I don't really know what it means. And to translate meta is very difficult. You can say, as in metaphysics, that it means xing er shang, which is uh, more about itself. Uh, about itself is we use the word self-referential. To talk about itself is called the meta as well. Uh, so this is uh, something that is very difficult to translate, and uh, it is now translated into Yuan Ju Chang, but if you've never seen it, it doesn't mean anything to you. Okay. And uh, uh, this is about a play that uh, 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 it des describes the aspects of a play that draw attention to its nature as drama or theater. So in this play, our tongue, it just wanted, to, wanted you to know that this is a play. It's not just a story told by somebody. It is a play. We're showing it as a play with a stage manager uh, with no uh, prop, no set, and uh, no actually no, nothing tangible. Everything is in mind. So, so this is uh, the ultimate meta theater for you. And one of them is breaking the fourth wall. Uh, when you're on stage, you have three walls, on the left, on the right, and in the back. And the, the front end is wide open towards the audience. So breaking the fourth wall means people on the stage talking directly to the audience. That is called the breaking the fourth wall. Uh, so these are the things that could happen in the meta theatrical uh, when when meta theatrical device was in, employed uh, one is direct at addressing to the audience uh, especially in the soliloquy uh, so it's not just a modern place if uh, you see a shakespeare play with hamlet he was holding on a skull of a dead person and he spoke a very, very long soliloquy to this skull. That's the, you can say that's the most uh, famous soliloquy in the world that is Hamlet talking to the skull. Because there's not a story, nothing is happening except for he is talking to a skull while letting the audience hear what he feels inside him. Okay, so that's called a soliloquy. Okay, that's one, one way to talk to the audience. And the many regular uh, play or movies, they would have a sidekick uh, for example, there would be a uh, dance, uh, Don Quixote, huh? Tang Ji Ke De. Uh, when he goes about doing things, there is a sidekick, okay, and that was uh, Sancho Panza. So anytime Don Quixote want to let you know something, he would tell his sidekick, 
and the, the audience will know what he's thinking about. That's a standard way for a play to tell a story by having a sidekick so that the main character could express his plan, his thinking, his feeling to this sidekick. So it's standard for any play to have a main character with a sidekick. That's a standard way. But in the meta theatrical way, you would have a narrator or a stage manager who address the audience directly. And he it this play continuously reminded you that this is a play. It is not store not a story that's happening on the stage. It is a play you're watching. Okay. And uh, uh, it reminds you that the person who's acting is an actor. He's not actually the real person in the story. He's just playing that person. And the time and place could be all skewed up. Uh, in this, I was watching the third one, and I said, oh, that's wrong. It's a... Uh, a synchronistic, which means the timeline was jumbled up. That's because the stage manager was on the stage. And he tells you that uh, this is just a regular story. It's not like Limber cross, uh, crossing, uh, uh, doing a solo, solo flight across the Atlantic and so on and so forth. Then I said to myself, this story was about 1901, the first act, and then it was about 1904 in the second act. And nine years later, the last act was 1913. Yes, the, there are three plays. And all of a sudden, you have this stage manager talking about Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, uh, piloting an airplane for the first time, solo piloting across Atlantic from New York to Paris, which happened in 1927. So you watched and you felt, oh no, that's wrong. He cannot possibly say that because he was in 1901 or 1904 or in 1913. That's way before Charles Lindbergh piloted the airplane. So it's called asynchronistic uh, as the word that I mentioned last time. The timeline was wrong. But in the meta-theatrical play, uh, time and place can be wrong because this stage manager, he did not live in that play. He was not a person in that time and place. That's why he could talk about something many years later, and it would not be wrong, okay? And it can also be plays within a play or eavesdropping uh, or a, a metaphor. So all these things can happen, which does not happen in the regular play but it can be a there can be a play within a play or it can be people talking something and you happen to eavesdropping which means uh, you heard it by accident uh, secretly unintended by the people who were talking there that's called the eavesdropping uh i learned about the word eavesdropping in the movie gone with the wind uh, when Scarlett O'Hara and uh, Red Butler in the very opening scene at uh, Twelve Oaks, they went to a party, the good times, uh, the good times before the Civil War. And uh, there were things happening in the story and uh, Scarlett O'Hara and uh, Red Butler um, they did not know each other, and they happened to be hiding in a, a living room somewhere else. And uh, there was Scarlett O'Hara. She 
was she she was sure she was in love with uh, Ashley uh, the 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 they are all cousins Emmy Ashley and uh, Melanie were intended to get married and uh, Scarlett O'Hara was very very angry and uh, she got Ashley into this private uh, area in the living room and uh, begged him to marry her instead but uh, of course Ashley would not marry him uh, marry her so Ashley went away and Scarlett O'Hara was very angry and she threw uh, something to the fireplace and the red butler who was hiding there uh, appeared and uh, there was the word eavesdropping because uh, Scarlett O'Hara was very angry that uh, someone heard that she didn't intend for anyone to know that she was in love with Ashley, but Ashley turned her down, uh, turned her proposal for marriage down. That's where you use the word, um, Scarlett O'Hara used the word that Red Butler was eavesdropping. Eavesdropping in that Chinese version of the novel is called the Yan Xia Gui. Huh? So it's somebody who is a Gui who was hiding under the eaves. That's what this eaves come about. So you were hiding. You were hiding under the eaves, which is the uh, uyen, under the uyen, outside the room. But you happen to listen to people talking inside. That's why you are the eavesdropper. Eavesdropper. That is what this word means. And in the meta theatrical play, you can, the audience can be eavesdropping on. Um, conversation that were not intended uh, for those people who were acting on the stage. So these uh, slides, three slides, were to explain you, to you what uh, the meta-theatrical device means. This is a, a, a devices that Thornton Wilder used a lot, a lot in this particular play and is kind of a revolution to do that. Let's get back to the play and there are three acts. Uh, one is daily life in 1901. Uh, the stage manager introduced to the audience this little town, uh, the streets and the railway station and uh, so on and so forth. So, uh, people delivering newspaper and the milk and so on. So that's the ordinary daily life. And the act two is about love and marriage. It talks about this boy and a girl who lives next to each other house. And they started to notice each other when they went to the high school together. And uh, they became acquainted and uh, they dated and they got married. So this is the second act about the love between the young boy and the girl who ended up getting married. And nine years later in 1913, the act three is called Death and Eternity. This is the most extraordinary act in this extraordinary play. It is that the girl who was giving birth to their second child, died of childbirth, and went to the cemetery, which included just a few chairs with other people who died before her sitting in each chair. And she came and sat in that uh, empty chair. She's a new arrival in the cemetery. And they talk to each other because they used to know each other and now they're dead and this girl could not bear the thought of being dead and no longer uh, uh, being with the husband and the children and so on and this is heartbreaking because you knew them as young kids falling in love and getting married and then 
she is gone in the cemetery with other people you might have met before, like the uh, alcoholic chorus conductor in the church and her mother-in-law. These were people who appeared before in the first and the second act, but they are now facing eternity and she wanted to go back. And uh, she was given the opportunity to go back to experience one of the best days in her life, which was an ordinary day, actually. She chose the day of her 12th birthday. And it's heartbreaking for the audience to see that when she knew that she would be dead, and this is her return to these people that she loved, but these people didn't care. They did not know that she was dead. They were carrying on as if she was only 12 years old. Now, so that, that is a huge, huge thing to experience. Any death in the play or movie is very serious. And when we see somebody die, we were we really were moved by the play. But this is devastating to see that the dead person going back, trying to feel the day when she was 12 years old, a very happy day, but other people just did not notice. Okay, so this is uh, the main point of Thornton Wilder. He said, I'm not writing about a small town everyday life. I'm writing about people and their opportunity to enjoy life but they don't appreciate. This is his main point. Wow. He said, our town is not offered as a picture of life in a New Hampshire village or as a speculation about the condition of life after death. It is an attempt to find a value above all price for the smallest events in our life. This is what he said. He is trying to show you how valuable the tiniest thing in life, the value of that. You have to find the value in that very trivial incident in your life. That's why it is so moving. And this is about why he chose to write a play with little scenery, no set, and the minimal props. Uh, all these mean all those daoju or bujing on the set. And his reason for doing that is, I try to restore significance to the small details of life by removing the scenery. So without any kitchen or streets or map or whatever there is, you would concentrate in the smallest detail in life. The audience through, land, through, through lending his imagination to the action restages it inside his own head. The audience was watching a play with no prop, no scenery, no set, so that they would use their imagination to create, to restage it in their head. So you can have the freedom to imagine the whole thing in your head because there's nothing on the stage. Uh, in his healthiest ages, he means like in Greek time, that's like six or five hundred dollars uh, years BC, huh? uh, he thinks that's the healthiest ages. There's, 
呃，戏剧的最最好的时代，哈、huh? ，The theaters are always exhibited the least scenery. So he thinks that the the best way to show some story on stage is not not to use a lot of scenery. That that's these are all quotes that he said. Huh? Mm. This is in more detail about how not using all any props and so on would enhance the move, the story.、Uh, and the the third bullet says Moliere said that for the theater, all he needed was a platform and a passion or two. Moli, I has a French. Uh, playwright, he said that to have a good play on stage, he only needs a platform and a passion or two. He doesn't need any scenery or props or set.、Huh? And the last one is the climax of this play need only five square feet of boarding and the passion to know what life means to us.、Uh, Thornton Wilder said, "Jig." This play that I just wrote and presented, ah,、uh, I only need five square feet of board. 只要只要有这么一小块，就可以演出最精彩的故事。哈、huh? ，You don't need anything, and you need the passion to know what life means to us. So he hopes the audience will understand from this very simple play the passion, what life means to us. Okay. And he thinks that our town is his favorite play. He wrote many plays, and he likes this the best. However, he said it was rarely done right. People who made it、uh, did not、uh, do it very right. So the, the, all those versions you saw, he he didn't think they were the best. Could that could be? And he said,、uh, "You should do it simply, dryly, and sincerely." That's the last three words. Simply, dryly, not dryly. Yes, dryly and sincerely. Instead of doing it、uh, with lots of sentiment or pon ponderousness, which is、uh, putting a lot of feelings or、uh, very seriously or、uh, feeling very heavy. To do this, you should produce or present this play simply, dryly, and sincerely. That's that's his instruction to people. Here is a portrait of Thornton Wilder.、Uh, he lived uh, almost eighty、uh, uh, years. Yes, seventy eight years. And、uh, he's a playwright and a novelist. Yeah. I, In this class, I use the word playwright many times. That is a, a, a writer who writes plays. That is playwright, and the novelist, the 写小说的哈 And he he won three Pulitzer Prize for no, novels and plays. Ha,、huh? one for novel, very early on, nineteen twenty seven, when he was like thirty years old. That was very young, and the book was called "The Bridge of Saint Louis." Ray, that's the first book I ever read, and I was moved to tears. I was just crying and crying when I read that book. And uh, uh, of all the books and movies I recommend, or I mentioned today,、uh, if you want to pick just one, I. I recommend you to read the book *The Bridge of Saint Louis Ray*. I'm sure you can find it in your local、uh, library. And he won Pulitzer Prize twice later for plays, not for novels.、Uh, first one is *Our Town*, and the second one is *The Skin of Our Teeth*. And he won a, a U.S. National Book Award for the novel *The Eighth Day*. Okay, so. So it's he's a really a very、uh, you know respected、uh, writer.、Uh, this different thing about his life was that he was born in China, 
Wilder had four siblings as well as a twin who was stillborn. So I assume that he was born with another baby who died very soon after birth. And he had four siblings. And all of them, that is five of them, not the one who died, five siblings, including himself, they lived in China for a while, though not for very long. They did go to the missionary school. And uh, his father was a U.S. Consul General, 就是一个领事官, the guanzhang. Huh? So he was a, a U.S. Consul General in Hong Kong and in Shanghai. So he was not an ambassador, but he was uh, just a uh, 领事官, the guanzhang. Huh? And so as a result, these children lived partly in China when they were young. And uh, let me see how old he was. He was in 70, 97. Okay. So he was uh, uh, born in 1897 and he left in 1912. So, uh, so he did spend some time in China. And of course, in 1912, there was uh, our Sun Yet Sen's uh, revolution. Huh? So uh, the situation was pretty precarious. That's why uh, the mother and the children came back to Berkeley. And the father was left there, I don't know for how long. Huh? So he uh, lived in uh, Shandong huh? uh, while his father was in Hong Kong and Shanghai. Uh, he was in Shandong and uh, he went to the mission school in Zhifu and uh, Yantai. Uh, these are both places in Shandong. Uh, however, they returned to California and then he went to Berkeley. He was pretty young, yeah, like 15 when he left. So I assume he could speak some Chinese. Those, uh, it could be forgotten. Uh, I did not find anything about whether he spoke Chinese or not. I imagine as a child that he could easily have picked up some Chinese. But however, if he left in when he was 15, then it's possible that he forgot some or all of it. And uh, they everywhere you go on you, uh, on internet, it says he's proficient in four languages, and they are English, German, French, and Spanish. So Chinese was not one of the languages that he's proficient in. Uh, proficient is a very the show. And uh, he is proficient, means he's really, really knew these languages, not just uh, some like Ni Hao or Hao and things like that. He could translate some very great literary work from a different language into Chinese, uh, like Jean Paul Sartre, on the other Sartre, huh? 就是存在主义的法国作家, Sartre. So these are really difficult books in other languages that he translated into English. And in addition, he wrote libretto or libretti. Okay, libretto is a single word and biscotti. Scato. Yeah, the, these are the uh, Italian words. Libretto is the singular version of libretti, which means goods. Uh, uh, goods in opera is called libretti. Huh? And there were two operas that he wrote the lyrics for, and I think he, he wrote them in English. And uh, uh, the 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 opera was done by other mu musicians, composers, of course. Uh, one is uh, the Long Christmas Dinner, and one one is the El Castida, El Castiad, El Castiad. I just read about this. Uh, it was extremely 
interesting to me, but uh, we probably don't have time to talk about everything we encounter. But this was a Greek play. It's both comic, a comedy and a tragedy uh, written by Euripides. Uh, there are three great uh, Greek playwrights that were immortal. They were just great, and they were around 500 years before uh, Christ. And Euripides, and the three of them, Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, they do extraordinary work. Even after 2,500 years, they are as fresh, as new, and as moving as, as anything you can see today. That's why they were repeatedly brought back into uh, adaptations. And this one was the uh, Alcestiad. It was a story by Euripides and uh, Thornton Wilder wrote a play called uh, this name. That, that, that's what's so wonderful about these uh, Greek tragedies. Well, this one happened to be comic. It is extraordinary. The story is fantastic. It's about a king uh, who did, who treated Apollo very well, and Apollo was in exile, and uh, Apollo decided to reward this king because of his hospitality with eternal life with one condition. When he, it's time for him to die, he has to find someone to die for him in order to, for him to live forever. And eventually his wife volunteered to die for him. That is a tremendous sacrifice because the king's father refused to do that. The father said, I am having such a good time living. I don't want to die for you. And the wife died for him. And then came the Adalis uh, Heracles, who decided to go to hell and uh, retrieved his wife. So the wife came back and became alive because this Adalis Heracles, uh, uh, Heracles, and it's also called the Herac Heracles. Anyway. Uh, because he's so strong, he did those extraordinary uh, things, including going to hell and uh, retrieve this dead wife. This is a fantastic story. I'm uh, uh, surprised that I've never heard of this before. And another different thing he did, Thornton Wilder did, Wilder did was to write a script uh, for Alf Alfred Hitchcock, who is a good friend, Hitchcock, uh, huh? they were good friend. And when Alfred Hitchcock wanted to do a movie called The Shadow of a Doubt, uh, he asked uh, Thornton Wilder to write a script, and he did. And this is a wonderful story. If you haven't seen it, it's a, a very good suspense story with uh, Joseph Cotton as the murderer. And uh, Teresa Wright as the teenage daughter and the uh, a niece, H uh, Joseph Cotton's niece. Now, that's a wonderful Hitchcock story, which was uh, earlier than many of uh, Hitchcock's famous later movies. Uh, let, let's talk about Thornton Wilder's uh, many creations. Uh, the first one is the one that I recommend you to go to the library to get. I wonder what that is. Connecting to audio. <laughs> okay. uh, philosophically, the book explores the question of why unfortunate events occur to people who seem innocent and undeserving. Uh, that is when something happened, which is tragic in this, in this case, it was in in the wild, there is a suspension bridge in Peru that suddenly broke and the five people on the bridge tumbled down to their death. And there was a, a, 
a priest or a monk, 有一个修士哈、huh? He was walking by on the donkey, and he saw it happen, and he was shocked by the event, and he decided to find out who these four five people are. Why God sent them to death? Why did God do them? Did they do anything wrong, or are they innocent and undeserving of death? And、uh, this form of storytelling was re reused again and again later in movies and uh, uh, fiction novels,、uh, especially in movies. You would have a big boat sinking. Uh, like Titanic or any other boat, and、uh, you would just have a story about different people in on that boat, or you would have、uh, like the、uh, in, inferno, towering inferno, ah,、uh, 摩天大楼烧火记 Okay, that's got dozens of big stars in that movie. So it is a skyscraper that was. Catching fire, and all these people, including who live there or happen to be there, or the firefighters,、uh, the movie would tell a little story about each person. So, the, Thornton Wilder was the creator of such a genre of modern disaster epic that is a big story about many important people、uh, that happened. In this disaster, now in this case, there were just five people on the suspension bridge, 就是一个吊桥上，在秘鲁的一个野外，没有人烟的地方。呃、uh, ，happens to the bridge just happened to snap, and five people died. So this story, which I told you that I was moved to tears,、uh, who when he was telling. The heartbreaking story of each of those who who were thrown off the bridge at that time, and it、uh, won the Pulitzer Prize in 1928, and、uh, the American Modern Library in 1998 chose it one of the 100 best novels of the 20th century. Okay.、Uh, I arranged all these of his works、uh, chronologically.、Uh, the second one is Our Town. So this this is、uh, also an earlier work by him and his first play to win to win the、uh, Pulitzer Prize. It was in 1938, and this play, as I mentioned before, it uses. Many meta theatrical devices.、Uh, here we have a choric narrator. Chorus is a 合唱团哈 A choric is an adjective that is a derivative of chorus. So in the Greek tragedy, you would often have a chorus there, and in this. Play called Our Town. There is a choric narrator. So this narrator called the stage manager, he tells you the story as if those chorus members were telling you in those ancient Greek、um, tragedies. So, so our town employs a stage manager and a minimalist set.、Huh? So you use hardly any set. It's called a minimalist.、Uh, minimal means the least,、huh? and the maximal means the most.、Uh, he wants you to have the experience, the human experience in this play by giving you. A choric narrator and a minimalist set. Okay, he himself played the stage manager on Broadway, so it was on stage first, and when it was successful, it came to Broadway, and the Thornton Wilder played the stage manager himself.、Uh, stage manager is the leading character in this. Play.、Uh, that's why Paul Newman, in later in his life, just about five years before, 
he he died. He played the stage manager in a, a big production, and uh, he was as a young man playing the young boy in that play many many decades ago. Okay, so Wilder himself played the stage manager uh, for two weeks, and later someone else took over, and he also showed up in the summer stock production. Huh? There are many plays are only in summer. They they were staged in summers, oftentimes in the park. For example, uh, I've seen a Shakespeare, Shakespeare in Central Park, New York, in the one I saw was Twelfth Night, I think. And I also saw many Shakespeare in the park in Seattle. We have an entity called the Green Stage. You can Google and look for it. And every year, except for the pandemic, maybe for two years, they stopped. But every year, they put down lots of Shakespearean plays, both comedies and the tra and uh, tragedies. And sometimes they throw in a few others, not by Shakespeare, for example, uh, Rex, uh, Oedipus Rex, uh, just, uh, King Oedipus. Uh, I don't know John huh? the 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 king who killed himself because he realized that he accidentally married his mother and produced several children. Uh, he was Oedipus Rex. Rex is the king. Huh? I've seen that uh, in Shakespeare in the park in Seattle and several others. I've seen many of them. Uh, these are all free and you can give them a donation or you can buy mugs or t-shirts from them. And... Uh, most people just sit there in the park on the grass for for free huh that that's a, a easy way to or a cheap way to get to know some of shakespeare's plays uh, this is what this summer stock production means it's only run in the summer and oftentimes just uh, in the park uh, selling no tickets uh, the play essentially is about the importance of the universality of the simple yet meaningful lives of all people. <clears throat> uh, it is to demonstrate the value of uh, appreciating life. So it's not to tell you what people actually do in a small village. It's just by showing you the simple life and the end, the shocking ending of a death returning to life that makes you realize that no matter how simple and how ordinary life is valuable and meaningful, if only you would pay attention to it. Okay, so this is another one. And this one is called The Merchant at Yonkers, and it was a failure. It was not an original play. He, uh, Thornton Wilder read or watched a play by an Austrian playwright whose name is Johann Nestroy, and the play is translated into English. He'll have himself a good time, and he named it The Merchant of Yonkers. It is a comedy. It was, oh, so funny. <laughs> when I read it for the first time, I I was broken into tears because it was so funny. However, the first version was a failure. People did not like it. But after a few years, uh, someone approached uh, Thornton Wilder and he rewrote this into The Matchmaker many years later, like 20 some years. And that person who asked him to do that became the producer and the director and the, who appeared in that play. 
the matchmaker. It was a very successful Broadway play. Uh, I've seen that play too. And uh, then most people would know that a new adaptation uh, called uh, Hello, Dolly with uh, Barbara Streisand. That was a very, very popular uh, play uh, or a musical on stage as a, uh, as well as a movie. It's a musical of The Matchmaker, and uh, it was commercially successful, but compared to the original play, which is The Matchmaker, it was not too good to me. I watched it recently, and uh, it did not make me laugh too much or appreciate. But of course, Barbara Streisand was very good, and she's such a wonderful singer. Uh, okay, so that one was the failure, and we will come to the next one, Matchmaker, when it when the time comes. The next one is 1941, The Skin of Our Teeth. This is, again, a, a, a strange form that is presented in the meta- theatrical way and it is you have a narrator uh, who's a, most of the time it's a maid in the household and there are different narrators who stand right on the stage while the play was being shown to you so this narrator would tell you what's happening and this is a, a weird thing they they say it's historical story but of course it's not it is about a time when there was a flood and the dinosaurs roamed the land and the things were happening that are very very shocking and this narrator would say yeah now the dinosaurs are approaching and so on and so forth so it is very weird when you read or watch it but it was well received and got uh, uh, the Pulitzer Prize, and when it was on Broadway, it's got top billing, uh, Frederick Marsh and the Tallulah Bankhead, and uh, Montgomery Clift, uh, uh, he was like 20 years old at that time. So that is a very well-received uh, play. Uh, though it's starkly different from our town, it is... Uh, having a similar theme. It's about a timeless human condition. The history is a progressive and a cyclical, and the literature, philosophy, and the religion as the touchstones of civilization. So our town is about an ordinary uh, 19th beginning of 19, uh, 20th century story about a small town and the everyday life, while the skin of our teeth is about a weird, you, you cannot time it because it's got dinosaurs, it's got flooding, and there's lots of different things happening. But it's all about how history is repeating itself, the timeless of uh, human condition and things like that. Huh? And this is about a husband, Mr. Antrobus, and his wife and their teenage uh, son. And I just mentioned there was a maid in the household. So these are all just uh, weird stories, okay? And uh, this uh, Thornton Wilder is very interesting, and he played uh, Mr. Ant Antrobus in, on the stage as well. So he is uh, prone to do, to play some of his uh, major actors on stage sometimes. This is a, a, a later production. Uh, this is a novel called The Ides of March. Uh, the Ides of March is a term that describes the day Julius Caesar was ass uh, assassinated. It was the 15th day of March. So it's called the Ides of March. And Ides means the 15th day. 
of March. It's only of March because some people would say Ides of April is tax day, but that would be wrong because the 15th day of April is not called Ides of April. Okay. And this is, uh, he's talking about uh, the Roman uh, Republic. In the Roman uh, Republic, when they uh, elected uh, Julius Caesar to be the dictator, uh, he decided to become the emperor. So he took the republic into a monarch. He he became the emperor of the empire, and many members in the Senate, including uh, Brutus, uh, who are pro-democracy, they decided to kill Julius Caesar uh, in order to save democracy. Uh, this is a story about the assassination of Julius Caesar. Uh, Brutus was uh, discovered described as the saint in the Senate. He was so great, passionate about democracy that he would organize some people to kill Julius Caesar. And they all, with a knife, killed Julius Caesar when he appeared in the Senate. Uh, this says uh, Thornton Wilder met Jean Paul Sartre, 就是沙特啊，这个呃，存在主义的 Sartre， and he was greatly、uh, influenced by Sartre， and he wrote a lot of things under the influence of existentialism. Ah,、uh, this existentialism is 存在主义的意思 Even though he himself is a devout Christian, and he would not be Become an atheist. Atheist is a 无神论哈，所以沙特呢，他主张这个 existential existentialism, but he is an atheist. 就是他是一个无神论的人。可是 Thornton Wilder is not an atheist. Uh. Then later in 1954, he wrote.、Uh, Uh, matchmaker,、uh, a person called the Tyrone Guthrie, encouraged him to re rework the Merchant of Yonkers into the Matchmaker.、Uh, I did not read the first play, which is the Merchant of Yonkers. Yonkers is a small town north of New York City, and when a train was invented, Yonkers became became a Just a suburb of New York, so many people live in Yonkers, and、uh, took the train to New York City to work. That is a big change in life. Of course, later star people start to drive their own cars, but still, the train is used by a lot of commuters, as did the Long Island Railway、uh, train. Yeah, the, the train <laughs> on Long Island. They. Facilitates lots of commuters, and the merchant of Yonker means just uh, this uh, merchant who owns a grocery store. And、uh, this store was in Yonkers, and there's a matchmaker who decided that she wants to marry this、uh, merchant because he has some money and he. Needs a wife to take care of him, and so on and so forth. It is just so funny if you read the book or watch the movie. This time, the play opened in 1955, and this Mr. Tyrone Guthrie, he、uh, is its director, and he play.、Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He. Winning a Tony Award for Guthrie, the director. Okay, so Guthrie was the director, but the Ruth Gordon is has the biggest role. That is the matchmaker, huh? Or in Hello, Hello Dolly, that's a role called the Dolly. So I've seen the version with the Shirley Booth. Yeah, that's the one I saw.、Hmm. With、uh, Anthony Perkins playing the store clerk,、uh -huh. 
Okay, and uh, of course, uh, Barbara Streisand played the uh, uh, Dolly in Hello, Dolly. And it became the basis for the hit 1964 musical, Hello, Dolly. Yeah. So uh, of all these, uh, The Merchant of Yonkers was a failure. The matchmaker was a winner. And the Hello, Dolly was a big winner. Uh, the Eighth Day was a... Uh, a short, uh, not a short, it's the longest story, uh, novel uh, Thornton Wilder ever written. He left his home in uh, New York or more in New England, and he went to live in Arizona for 20 months in 1962 and 1963. Uh, so he lived by himself away from his home. Well, his home being, uh, you know, he is a gay gay man, so he had a partner. He did not have wife or children. There he started the, his longest novel, The Eighth Day, which went on to win the National Book Prize, Book Award. Uh, it's about a small town in Amer America. I have not seen that read that book and I was not aware whether it was made into movies or plays. But this one uh, called the Theophilus North, okay, Mr. North, uh, was his last novel, Thornton Wilder's last novel. And uh, it was published in 1973 as an autobiographical novel. It's got 17 chapters, one uh, is a story about one of each is a single story about Mr. North. Uh, it's about this Mr. North. You can see Anthony Edward on this movie poster. Uh, Anthony Edwards later became very famous with George Clooney in a TV series called the ER, which means emergency room. Uh, so both of them were in there became enormously popular. Of course, George Clooney more so than Anthony Edward. Uh, but this is Anthony Edward in uh, Mr. North, which is before ER. I'm sorry, there are 15 chapters. I just said 17. There are 15 chapters, each one treating a different episode where, where North is involved. And it's autobiographical. So it's a story about his life, Thornton Wilder's life, uh, in the form of a short story collection about Mr. North, okay? And there are all these uh, film adaptations of our town. So even as a movie, uh, there were serious productions other than high school productions. For example, the second one was in 1953. It's got Mary Martin and Oscar Hammerstein second. The, these two are really blockbuster uh, big names. Uh, Mary Martin for a time was extremely, you can say she was the most popular uh, actress in American musicals before Julie Andrews. Uh, she was in... Uh, Peter Pan and The Sound of Music and many others. And when they were about to make South Pacific, she was too old. And uh, uh, his opposite on stage already died. And they chose uh, Rosano Brasi as a, a new one to replace. And Mary Martin would be too old to be opposite to the young Italian actor. So they chose uh, Missy Gaynor. Uh, so Mary Martin was the name to recognize in the old days for any musicals. And uh, a movie in 1955, which is a musical, a live musical on TV, and it's got uh, Frank Sinatra, as a stage manager, and Paul Newman as a young boy, George Gibbs, and Eva Marie Saint as Emily. 
And uh, the two of them were later in uh, the movie called the, the Exodus. That was the movie I first chose to discuss in my class. Unfortunately, before we could talk about it, it was taken off YouTube. Um, the, the Exodus, if you have access to the movie The Exodus, that is a good movie with Paul Newman and Eva Marie Saint. But this version of All Our Town also has Frank Sinatra, who is a, a big, big name. huh? And in uh, 1977, there is a TV version. And this was the first one I watched in my life of this play. It's got Hall, Paul Holbrook. I like him very much, and he died not too long ago. And he won an Oscar for supporting actor before he died. He was the oldest person to ever win an Oscar acting award. And it was uh, Into the Wild. The movie's called Into the Wild by Krakauer, who also wrote the book in about uh, climbing the Mount, Mount Everest. Uh, Hal Holbrook is a stage manager, and I liked him in this play very much. And that was, as I just mentioned, the first version of Our Town I saw, and I was greatly, greatly impressed by this play. And we had Robbie Benson as George Gibbs and Glynis O'Connor as Emily Webb, compared to other big stars. These two are small, small actors. They were not big stars. And they uh, you can say the two of them act the parts better because they're much younger than uh, Frank, uh, than uh, Paul Newman and, uh, and uh, William Holden. Huh. Okay, the First one had the William Holden in 1940. So I saw the version 1977 uh, with this young couple, new beginner actors, but Hal, Hal Holbrook as a stage manager, and he was an old hand, and he did a very good job. Yeah, I like the, uh, the one with Paul Newman as stage manager as well. And there were other people like Spalding Gray in the next one in 1989. Uh, yeah, I didn't. Uh, uh, oh, well, that's that's the one I watched last week. Yeah, that's the last one I watched. Uh, that's the Lincoln Center. Okay. And in 1994, there is a ballet version of it. And there were operas and the ballet and the musicals. Uh -huh. And the... Uh, 2003, that Paul Newman was a stage manager and the opera was later. Okay. So all these were different adaptations. Some of them are really, really very wonderful. And this one is uh, Our Town. It was first uh, a stage play on Broadway with Martha Scott. Uh, and she, uh, she and many others in that play were carried over into this movie. And it's got William Holden in it when he was like 22. And uh, this movie has one thing in particular. It is uh, original music score was composed by Aaron Copland. Aaron Copland could be considered one of the most famous American composers. For hundreds of years, mu music in America was always not recognized by their European co counterpart. But with Aaron Copland, uh, people start to recognize there are American composers who are worth noticing. And of course, uh, in the field of opera or orchestra, uh, only with uh, some new, very, very recent people that America was noticed by European uh, 
musical world, for example, Leonard Bernstein or the singers, some singers. Yeah, it used to be that if you sing in America, you cannot be any good. If you sing opera in America, and now they they are very recognizable talents from America that went to Europe and uh, blew their blew what away. <laughs> anyway, this Aaron Copland is someone to know. And this one, uh, the writer Thornton Wilder, and the 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 producer both worked together. Uh, they faithfully followed the play in most ways, except for two things. One is it's got real scenery and people were actually uh, carrying milk bottles and deliver to people and uh, this and that uh, everything is just like a regular movie and the other thing is the last act uh, the, in that act emily died and went to sit in the cemetery but the playwright Thornton Wilder, he changed his mind. He thinks that on the stage, people see it as if it's something that they were watching. However, in the movie, people see the story and they have a real connection to the people and they feel their intense love for this beautiful young girl who died and it's devastating for moviegoers so he decided with the producer of the movie that they should change the story to make this part a dream of Emily so Emily would dream that he died and went to the cemetery and came back uh, in physical forms and later on he woke up from the dream and the uh, the movie audience were so relieved to see that she was not dead. So the producer worked with Wilder in creating these changes. So you cannot say it's an outrage because the, the writer himself, he agreed and he made the changes for the producer. He thinks that the moviegoer have a right to see Emily alive because they loved this girl so much. Okay, what do you agree? <laughs> okay. Now, is there anyone who wants to say anything about any of William Holden's movies? And he's famous for all these wonderful movies like Our Town, Sunset Boulevard, Born Yesterday with uh, Billy Holiday, Sabrina with the uh, you no, know, Humphrey Bogart and uh, Audrey Hepburn, a country girl with Bing Crosby and uh, uh, how do you call that girl? Grace Kelly, yes. And Bridges at Tokori, that is in during the Korean War. Du Guli Chao Yi. Love is a many splendor thing. It's about uh, a Hong Kong a journalist is sent to Hong Kong meaning William Holden's character, uh, falling in love with a Chinese woman, uh, Han Su Ying. Han Su Ying, who is a doctor, and he actually went to Sichuan or somewhere to visit the woman's family. But later he died with a by a stray bullet during the war. Okay, the picnic. He, he was a uh, uh, a backpacker. <laughs> Nowadays, you say a backpacker. He was uh, riding on the tr freight train from place to place uh, during the bad times. And this has a uh, Kim Novak, Jin Lu Hua, as a leading character uh, actress. Uh, probably the most famous would be the bridge on the River Kwai, Kwai, Kwai He Da Chiao. You should pronounce it as Kui, okay? Kui is, uh, yeah, probably by far the most uh, appreciated movie. The Horse Soldier with uh, John Wayne, 
the world of Susie Wong with and Nancy Kwan about the a prostitute in Hong Kong. And uh, William Holden is a poor reporter or writer. The Wild Bunch is a very bloody, violent movie with Sam Peckinpah, I think. A network is about uh, TV news. Uh, the net, there are three new networks, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC, and the network ha had, uh, what's his name? He died before the movie was uh, won the Oscar for him. Peter Finch. Peter Finch, yes, Peter Finch, yes. And uh, I saw it so long ago, I did not even remember William Holden was in it. But Peter Finch is marvelous. Uh, he opened the door of, uh, I mean, the window of his, he said, he on the news, he, he told the audience who are watching the news, say, just open your do window and uh, yell, I've had enough of it and I'm not going to take it anymore. And so everybody did that after they watched the network news on that day. <laughs> That's quite a satirical story. So did, can anybody say anything about William Holden? Well, yeah. Have you seen Stammer 17? It was about a POW in Germany during the war. Yeah. He won the best uh, actor Oscar for that. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, I think I, I, I like uh, William Holden always said he seems to have a very kind, very warm uh -huh. presence. Yes, yeah, warm yeah. and very personable. He's yeah, very, very American. Yeah, yeah, so, especially I, in the bridge on the river. Quite oh, yeah, opposite this very British Alec Guinness, it's quite a contrast, <laughs> right? Very stiff, very gentlemanly. Yeah, uh, I, I first noticed Holden. I think, mm, I mean, I saw him. The first impression was that uh, was Gloria Swanson in that Sunset Boulevard. Yes, and, yes, uh, yeah, that yeah. Was an amazing movie, right? And I, but I liked him maybe at the age when I saw the movie. The uh, Love is a Many Splendor Thing was the uh -huh. Eurasian doctor, uh -huh, in Hong yes. Kong setting. Yes. I said, uh -huh. oh my God, what a love to your story. Uh -huh. You made me cry. And the theme song was very. Uh, yes, uh -huh. yes, yes, very popular. Yes. Very popular, yes. And, yeah. Uh, if it yeah. were made today, it, they would probably find a Chinese woman it, to play that role. Right, right. <laughs> it was played by Jennifer Jones. Right. And well, she played a Eurasian, I think so, but uh, yeah. still, yeah. But, She's excellent. Um, yeah. And again, he was in uh, with Nancy Kwan in the world of Susie Wong again, mm -hmm. set in Hong Kong and all that. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just felt uh, kind of a uh, like him, just mm -hmm. you know, just mm -hmm. like him, yeah. Uh, the just like many stars, they had their great time, and uh, later on. Nobody want them anymore, especially yeah. uh, with his case. He was an alcoholic, so it's yeah. really hard to deal with that. Uh, yeah. When you hire somebody and he's always uh, drunk and we could not perform. Uh, movie business yeah. is very serious. Right. I read someplace saying that um, when when he's first like starring. Starring a uh, uh, a role was in the movie, uh, the Golden Boy, that mm -hmm. was I think nineteen thirty nine, mm -hmm. and uh, Barbara Stanwyck was in there, the leading lady. Uh -huh. At that uh -huh. time, he was a newcomer, uh -huh. and uh, but Barbara Stanwyck is already a known star, yeah. but uh -huh. she took a liking of him and went out her way to help yeah. him and yeah. encourage him. Uh -huh. Yeah, so later. And um, Barbara Steinway was all her movies. She never won an Oscar, but uh, an honorary uh, Oscar in 1982. So, uh -uh. And apparently at her 
acceptance speech, uh-huh. she gave a personal, uh, paid a tribute to to William Holden because uh, from their golden boy days, they uh, because of her help and they became long lifelong friends. So mm-hmm. when she uh, when she um, won the uh, honorary uh, award mm-hmm. in 1982. Holden had just died a few months wow. prior from an wow. accident. Mm-hmm. I think he was drunk and fell and bled mm-hmm. to death. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, so she had mentioned that uh, um, she she loved him, she misses him, and that that he had always thought that she should have won an Oscar. So she said that night, she said, this is, you know, you... Golden Boy, your wish had come true because she finally did get an Oscar. So there was a, I didn't know about that story. So that was kind of yeah. touching. Yeah. yeah. So he was ex- extremely popular. Yeah. Top 10 stars for six times. Yeah. <clears throat> Apparently she was really having a real relationship with Audrey Hepburn. Uh, while they were form, uh, filming yes. the uh, yes. Sabrina. Uh-huh. Yeah. Read about <laughs> and the that. director did not know. And yeah. Everybody on the set knew that. Uh, knew about Luke that. Holden yeah. and Audrey Hepburn were a couple yeah. for a while. Yeah. Uh, but Audrey Hepburn finally decided not to marry him. Right. At, at that time, uh, William Holden was married. Uh, oh, yeah. I've read about um, Audrey Hepburn wanted to have lots of children, and mm. William Holden had a vasectomy, so right. he could not have any children anymore. However, other sources would say Audrey Hepburn did not marry him because he was an alcoholic. Alcoholic, yeah. Yeah. That's a lifelong problem that he had. Uh-huh. Yeah. And th- this is how he died. He bled to death in his yeah. apartment. He was drunk, and he his, hit his head when he fell, slipped down the, a rug, and uh, hitting his bedside table. Yeah. That's what similar is- to uh, Stephen Foster, who wrote many popular songs. Stephen Foster was the composer of uh, uh, Oh Susanna or Groom. Mm. Old Black Joe, yeah. Way Swanee River, lots. Of, I Dream of Jeannie, and yeah. a, a Beautiful Dreamer, and lots of songs. He was a very kind person, but he's a, he was an alcoholic. So in, in the end, his wife and children left him, and he was homeless in New York City. And yeah. one night he was drunk and in a shelter, and he hit his head by falling. Uh, probably on the hit on the bedside table and the blood. Mm. Yeah, he was like thirty-seven years old, very young. Mm. Uh, alcoholism is really a terrible thing. Uh, right. It's an addiction. Your, yeah, for a child yeah. growing up in a household with an alcoholic parent, it is terrible. It must be very difficult. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now he's Paul Newman, yeah. Can you say something about Paul Newman? Yeah, a lot more things to talk about. What can you say about Paul Newman that hasn't been said? (laughs) (laughs) One thing is he (laughs) married his second wife, Joanne Woodward, and they Mm -hmm. had a very, very long marriage. And they worked together in the same movie many times. For example, the long hot summer uh, yes. from the terrace, Paris Blue. Uh, yeah. I think there's one later on. The steam live in time. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. uh, uh, like six or seven, probably uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bridge was in 1990. Uh, he, Paul Newman, and uh, uh, Joanne Woodward. Joanne oh, yeah. Woodward is a great movie star yes. by her own right. However, her husband is just way too smart, too too popular, too too 
way more famous than she was, even though she won an Oscar for Three Faces of Eve before she married Paul Newman. But mm-hmm. later on, her f- films are few. And the last one is a 2022 movie. It's about the life of Paul Newman and his wife. It was mm-hmm. done a documentary by Ethan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he visited, mm-hmm. uh, interviewed many of the older people. Mm-hmm. That's a movie after Paul Newman died. Yeah, I figured he passed before that. Yeah, yeah, that's a like a six episode of TV series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but mm-hmm. Paul Newman actually won an Oscar. He was nominated many, many times. Um, he won it later, right? Uh, is that Color of Money? No. I yes, Color know. of Money with Tom Color of Cruise. Money. Uh huh. Yeah. He was fine, fine actor. Very. Yeah. Good. Very good. Uh, he was in uh, the Hustler, which is a prequel of Color of Money, playing. Oh, yeah? uh, huh. You know. A player of a snook. Yeah. Pool. Um, yeah, yeah. Pool table. Yeah, pool, pool table. table. Player yes. with uh, yeah. Jackie Gleason. Yes. And yes. Uh, what's the young the 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 actor who played the General Patton, George, George C. Scott. C. Scott. George C. Scott. Yes. He mm-hmm. was in uh, the Hustler, yeah. Actually, Hustler, yeah. He probably won an Oscar for it. Who Gleason? Or Jackie Gleason. Gleason. Yeah. Gleason yeah. did not win an Oscar. I he think didn't. George no. C. Scott. Uh, he, of course, he won uh, for Patton, Patton later on, and he was the first one who turned it down. He just would not accept it. <laughs> He says Oscar is a, just like a zoo showing all these big stars and uh, trying to be chosen. And uh, it's an a ugly show. So he would not be fooled by people, by people watching him as a pet. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's another movie star, Marlon Brando. He did not appear to pick up the award for his role in uh, The Godfather. Oh. And uh, he sent an Indian, local indigenous American Indian woman, I think she's called the Light Feather or something, <laughs> to pick up. He, he did not turn down the, this award. He sent someone to receive it on behalf of him, but mm made a speech uh, about how American movie or Hollywood treated the Indian people because Indian people were always uh, violent, uh, unreasonable, Mm -hmm. uncultured, uh, not civilized, uh, and uh, all sorts of bad things. Hardly any Western movie uh, depicted uh, indigenous people in a decent, honorable way. Yeah. 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 I guess more and more the the, the actor actress uses that, that the, the opportunity as a platform to express their personal yeah. political view. I just view heard or, that uh, the president of Ukraine requested to be present and at the Oscar show in order to plea to people to support their country but they were he was turned down twice including this time yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's a sad situation there mm-hmm. don't know how long that's going to drag on <laughs> yeah okay yeah. Uh, Paul Newman is also famous for car racing he oh, really yeah. drives a race car and was uh, winning in many Races yeah. in yes. a very decent placement. Yeah. And he also 
uh, is a boss created a Newman's best brand of food. You, oh, yeah. First it was a spaghetti sauce and then he branched yes. out to yeah. many other supermarket items. Yes. And he would put all the the profits into charitable yeah. entities. Yeah. That's yeah. A, That's a, a good thing. A yeah. Pretty good person. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I think I'm not going to talk more about the word meta. It is very complicated. I don't know how to translate. And it, it's called. Just, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. Shit. <laughs> oh sure. I just thought of didn't they Facebook change the name to Yes, Meta? exactly. Yeah. Meta is okay. is beyond or after or self self-referential. For example, for meta theory, it's a theory about a theory. And the meta -math mathematics is a mathematical theories about mathematics and the meta axiomatics is axioms, uh, it's like a theory or axiom is a basic theory about axiomatic system and the meta humor and, and all these things. It's really, really hard to find me. So I got all these uh, Chinese words, but if you want, you're interested, you can look for it, but I really don't know what ho shi means but I don't know about meta either. So here is a meta. It's like an infinity sign. It's called meta platforms. That's a common, it's the company behind Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp and many others. So now mm -hmm. you call Facebook as a company of meta. So... Mm -hmm. You can say meta universe or metaverse. Uh, these are metaverse is a, a universe. It's an alternative digital or virtual universe. If you put on this kind of a goggle, you would have virtual reality or augmented reality on your screen when you are looking at things for example for example if you go to rome and you look at all these uh, ruins and your goggle will tell you this is from what time who built it and so on and so forth if you have seen the movie the terminator that's what is <coughs> predicted and it now it becomes true you would see uh, arnold schwarzenegger uh, as a EI person. He's a person created by, it's a computerized person. When he walks about, he sees something, all those statistics, statistics would appear on his screen. If you remember that movie, that's pretty old too. Uh, so usually we would say metaverse is a 3D virtual world when you look through a goggle like this. Okay, and uh, I just happen to be talking about everything, everywhere, all at once with my high school people on Zoom yesterday. And they told me it's called the Ma De Duo Chong Yu Zhou, <laughs> which is a very funny name. And it's about multiverse. Huh? We just talk about the metaverse. That's the... Uh, Whatever. This is called multiverse. Uh, this character Michelle Yeoh was playing. She was in and out of many different universes. So it's a multiverse. And uh, the main universe is alphaverse. And you can do verse jumping from universe to universe. Anyway. It's very weird to me. However, when I checked on Wikipedia, it's got five, uh, four translation for this title. Uh, the first one is from Taiwan. This one, Ma De Duo Chong Yu Zhou. And this one is uh, in China, they call it Shun Xi Quan Yu Zhou. And in Hong Kong and uh, Macau, they call it Qi Yi Nu Xia Wan Jiu Yu Zhou. Well, the last one is in Malaysia and Singapore. They call it Tianma Xingkong. I would think this one is excellent. 
It's so elegant and uh, very suitable for this movie. Just call it <laughs> Tian Mai Xing Kong. Okay. And uh, it's, if you have seen it, it's got four, three parts. It's everything, everywhere, all at once. That's the first part, second part, and third part. And it's got a Chinese title for every one of them because it's a Chinese movie. And it's also funny to see all these people speaking Chinese while they were born in Taiwan or China or Hong Kong, Macau or Malaysia. They're they all from different places. I think American people would uh, come to some kind of reckoning, realizing that all these people sp speak Chinese. And here I have a picture of Michelle Yeoh. And uh, she made a wonderful speech two, three, one, two, three, three days ago. And she said, ladies, don't let anybody tell you you are ever past your prime. Huh? So she, as an Asian woman and an older person, 60 years old, and she's Malaysian, and she tells all the Asian women in the world that don't let anybody tell you you're ever past your prime. Huh. Okay, this is really very inspiring. However, if you haven't heard, this was edited by Korean TV news. When South Korean broadcaster show this part of Michelle Yo accepting the world or the war, the award oscar award they censored the word ladies they say don't let anybody tell you you are ever past your prime because ladies really stir the pot uh, people in korea would feel justified to do something extraordinary so they would not let it happen so the national tv cut off the word ladies so that people can only see no ladies it was cut off and not, and it was not translated into korean language either uh the 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 people at the news tv station they say they think that michelle you didn't mean only ladies so they cut that word off <laughs> isn't that funny uh, that is because korea is a very uh, not equal a very anti-feminism country sexist. yeah sexist or misogyny misogynistic misogynistic i don't know and uh, the new president was elected because he proposed to abolish the country's gender equality ministry so like every country they have ministries like xing zheng yuan the jiao yu bu nei jiao nei zheng bu wai jiao bu but they have a gender equality ministry 就是两性要 and this new person was elected president because he proposed that they eliminate this special because he didn't want women to be equal to the men. So it's a very, very anti-feminist country. And on the scale of 146 countries, South Korea was rated number 99 as being not pro-feminism. It, it sounds really horrible for a, a TV station to arbitrarily cut off the word ladies because it's the ladies was very important in, in that sentence. It's telling all the ladies not to men, okay? <laughs> okay, so so that's it. Uh, unless something you want to say something else, 
And I want to let you know that I chose this movie of Mice and Men. It was written by John Steinbeck uh, in the movie version. Of course, there are many versions, and this one was a rather recent in 1992 with John Malkovich and uh, Gary Sinise, and it was directed by Gary Sinise. So just go to YouTube and look for Off Mice and Man. And if you need more help, John Malkovich or Gary Sinise or 1992 would take you to this specific one. Okay. Anything else? Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.